Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. I love the playing lessons. You have to kind of teach them to play smarter. And that usually boils down to course management and a lot of short games. Everybody, if they've got 20 minutes before their tee time, they will hit golf balls for 19 minutes and 59 seconds. And then they'll go to the first tee. Then they'll just overlook the most important areas, which is short games. How good are you from 100 yards and in? Can you be consistent? And at the very end, I mean, that's really what your score is going to dictate. I know everybody's going to have something they want to work on full swing. So if they wanted to do a playing lesson, I love for just to kind of not work on your swing while we're on the golf course. You know, maybe spend 30 minutes of just we kind of work a little bit on swing, you know, just in a controlled atmosphere, and then go to the golf course. So that way we can kind of work a little bit on course management, where to play, if greens are tucked away, play a little smarter, play away from some flags. And a lot of people really learn to get better simply by going on the golf course with a PGA professional. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter podcast, Marcus. Hi, Fred. Thanks. Thanks to be here. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Yeah. Uh, this is what we nice. call a mulligan, right? Exactly. So Marcus and I got together. I've told this story briefly, but Marcus and I got together down in Mexico last uh, in, in December of 2010. I was down in Cancun on vacation and came down to an area of Playa del Carmen. It's on the, the Caribbean side on the east coast of Mexico. And there's this beautiful golf course called El Camelion, where uh, at Mayacoba um, and the Jim McLean Golf School is there. And after I played golf, Marcus and I got together to do an interview. And we went through, oh boy, it, it was a really lively interview. Um, for and, and about 26 min minutes into it, I realized I had not pressed record. And, and we even talked about the guys on the driving range and everything. Well, we'll make that up today. We'll we'll <laughs> we'll figure that out. But it, it's talk. So you were gracious enough to grant me a mulligan. That is a true professional. You're granting me a mulligan to tee it up one more time and and get a chance to talk to you. And I really appreciate that. Well, every golfer deserves that second ball, right? Well, I don't know. Do they? Hey, that's against the I, rules. I I, I I think I'm well off the first tee. I mean, we're not if you're not in the U.S. Open. I think you should at least get one. Yeah, I know, but it's not off the first tee. I, you know, I told you I've been doing this these interviews for this is our sixth year, so <laughs> I should know how to hit record well, by true, this true. point. But every person I know uh, it, that does any type of recording has at least one story where they exactly. did something that was awesome and never pressed record. Unfortunately, I have more than one story like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody's, you know, snap, snap hooked one off the first tee, so. Right. Well, don't we call that a breakfast ball? I, I mean. Uh, I, breakfast ball. You ever, have you yeah, heard that absolutely. term? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've heard the breakfast ball, everything. I've heard them all. Yeah. We'll share some because I think we all need them in our bag. We need to know what the other terms are. <laughs> absolutely. Um, all right, so let's let's talk first about Mexico golf. Uh, you've you've how long have you been down in Mexico, and where are you from originally? You're not from Mexico. You're you have no accent. No, I'm actually originally from the Houston area. I uh, grew up in Houston and went to college in Michigan, and then um, was back in Houston for my first job at Houston Country Club. I worked there for three to four years, and then I finally broke in at the Jim McLean Golf School in Miami at Doral, which is our pretty much our main headquarters of everything. That's where Jim is based out of. And after working with Jim for seven to eight years, uh, Jim wanted to open up a school in Mexico that I actually looked at this place about three or four years ago when it was brand new. And then, uh, you know, they were finally ready to put a golf school, you know, they've grown enough and, you know, they contacted us and Jim wanted me since I was bilingual to come down here and open up the golf school, which was a perfect fit for me. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to, I was going to ask you about that, but you are bilingual growing up in, is it because of growing up in Houston area? Uh, parents are from Spain. So uh, I was kind of grew up, I actually, so you were as, speaking as when I was little, yeah. yep. Parents spoke to me in Spanish my whole life. Well, that was Spanish as opposed to Mexicanish Spanish. Well, are they different? Pretty... <laughs> Uh, accents are different and some words are different, but you know, 
all in all, you can understand each other pretty easily. Okay, that's good to know. And, and why? What is, what is it about the Jim McLean Golf Schools um, that are unique? Well, I think what, what Jim has done that's unique is that he really doesn't teach one way to everybody. Uh, I think we, we spoke out about it before. You know, there's tall people, short people, people flexible, people unflexible. You know, Jim kind of teaches along uh, the lines of safety zones, and that's been his most important teaching. Because like we said, you know, not everybody can swing the same way. And we're getting a lot of instructors nowadays that, you know, they teach one method, and then the method's not really the way to do it. You know, you really want to just teach a comprehensive teaching system. I mean, that's really what you want to do. Because not one one size doesn't fit all in golf, and I think that's what we we've seen with people. You know, we we teach in safety zones, really. That's our main focus. Do you, can I make one request? Do you mind if I make one request? Please, sure. please, please, in in this in this conversation, please don't ever say like I said before, because one, our listeners never heard it, and two, you don't need to rub it in that I didn't in record. <laughs> 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 I know no, that no you problem. said it before, but nobody else does it. It's just not. It's just come on, man. <laughs> You're allowing me the mulligan, but don't keep reminding me of the mulligan. Oh, don't worry. I got to make you feel it. I got to make you feel it. Gee, thanks. That's going to help. Uh, on the... Hey, if I if I've ever hit a bad shot, trust me, my friends will let me not let me live it down. Yeah, right. It's going to look great on the on my scorecard. Um. So, <laughs> so the, the Jim McLean approach. You're talking about that every every player is unique, but when you you have a really nice facility there at Mayakoba, um, I was really impressed that the hitting bay that you have uh, opens up to the driving range, but no one else is going to be looking in while they're on the driving range. So you, you can really do individualized attention without someone feeling self-conscious. Um, do you use video? Yeah, that's probably, I'd say our main basis of teaching is using video. We've got two different bays here. Uh, three different cameras in every single bay, and you can you know just really teach off all different angles. So, video is really just the way people I've found that learn the best. You know, everybody's a good visual learner. You know, and when you get to use video and kind of show them their faults, and then especially more importantly, I think when you show them their changes, because you know one thing that we've always told people is what you feel and what's real are two different worlds, and video is the one thing that's going to show you that. Mm, and but do you? Uh, like so many people, do you look at somebody's swing and everyone, of course, has a unique swing? Um, and do you say, yeah, but look what you're doing and here's, here it is compared to Tiger or to Furyk or to Phil. Um, do, you, do you put an A-B screen there and try to get people to change their swing to be like someone else? Um, you know what I like to do more than anything is I kind of go off maybe like body types. You know, I mean, you know, think about tall, you know, tall people like Dustin Johnson, you know, you get, you know, that real wiry kind of tall look. And then you got guys like Craig Perry, you know, who's that little short soccer, short arms. And a lot of times what I like to do is kind of find somebody that kind of suits the way, you know, their body is, you know, and you kind of look at people's flexibility and the way they swing when they're kind of warming up. And I kind of do that because like I said, you know, I don't want to show every single student, you know, a guy like Tiger who's got amazing flexibility, can keep his left arm perfectly straight or like Ernie Els. And then they see them, they go, well, why can't I do that? Well, because, I mean, you don't have the flexibility. You don't have a personal trainer with you two hours every day and don't have that kind of life where you can actually do that. And you've got to work around the person who plays golf once every two months. Yeah. So you've got to build a swing that's going to, you know, something that's going to be, um, I think very fundamentally sound. Uh, a lot of times, a little more of a compact swing that when they do play once a month or whatever they play, they got a swing that they can try and repeat easier. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would also think that because you're in a resort destination, that you don't have the opportunity to work with somebody on a weekly basis. That you only get a day or two or a few hours with somebody to to. <laughs> mess with them, right? Well, actually, true. In, in a way, a lot of times when you are in resorts, uh, you don't get that chance. What's been actually really nice about this place is that we have a great uh, local following, too, if you can believe it, because really? we are the only golf, we're the only golf school in this whole Riviera Maya area, built from Cancun to all the way south of Tulum, which is 40, 50 miles south of us. We're the only golf school. And how many so, golf courses you know, are there? There's, I believe, 15 total, uh-huh. and and we are the only golf school teaching facility. Really? So we are no, starting with, yeah, 
we are getting we're the only we're getting a nice little local following. Actually, getting a, a nice little group of juniors also. I've got a top six juniors in the area here, so I actually, which is kind of nice because when I used to work in in Doral in Miami, uh, people had they could go anywhere to take lessons, and you know sometimes going to the Doral was a little bit you know out of their way, so you wouldn't get that many locals and see like you said see every week and see how they progress. So I actually get a nice little mixed bag. I get a little bit of the resorts where I, I see them for you know, two or three days and then, you know, may not ever see them again. And then I've got those where I see them once a week. So I, I actually get a nice little mix of people. Hmm. So, but what about people like myself who come down for a week and, and, you know, uh, I mean, I would love to come down for a week and play golf three or four times, but I'm really, uh, on this past trip, I was down there to spend a nice week with my wife. So the fact that I got permission to have a day of golf was a wonderful thing. Um, but if I were to come to a, a school for a day, come to the Jim McLean school um, that you're running there, uh, what, how would you help me? What would you be able to do without, you know, I mean, you're not going to rebuild my swing in, in a two hour period. No, you know, no, the, the one thing I'm probably going to do is like I said, you know, when we video you outside, you know, we kind of get an idea of how you aim. Uh, and then when we look at video, you know, we sit down and, you know, kind of look at what, what's going to be the most important thing that's going to give you consistency. Because I'd say a very nice student that I ask, you know, what do you want to improve upon? I'd say their number one thing out of their mouth is consistency. So what we got to do is find out what's going to make you more consistent. It, it, a lot of times it, it comes down to uh, the way your body moves, not so much really the club. You know, a lot of times it's, you know, more of just getting your body to work the correct proper sequence more than anything else. So what I do is really, you know, if you're here with me for a day or two, all I can really do is get, put the wheels in motion. Let's, let, let, you know, we can say it that way. And then when you go home, question is, you know, can you take the steering wheel and keep driving straight? I always, you know, recommend that when you do go home, you know, you're going to go home with either a video I'm going to give you, or we'll give you pictures with all the notes that, you know, everything we ever talked about. So when you do go to your, let's say your piece, professional at home, I think it's important that, you know, you take your little binder with you and you kind of show them, hey, I was working on this. I kind of want to stay along those lines. Can we kind of film it and see if I'm, I'm going in the right path or not? And that, you know, that's where it's always going to help you because, like I said, I might be uh, 3,000 miles away from a student. And, you know, at times I do have some students that will send me videos, which is kind of nice. I mean, you know, technology is getting now to the point where I can have a student come here from Vancouver and let's say he goes home and he can only swing very easily, upload in his computer. He sends me a Windows media file, and then at my office, I can open up our golf program, and I can shoot up in a JC video. And from there, I can actually do a voiceover. Mm. So his that he does, I could compare it to maybe the player I was comparing him to before, talk about it, draw lines, and kind of show him the differences and what things you're still doing well, and I can send it back to him. So let's say on your computer at home back in Vancouver – this guy would open up his computer, open up that file, and then he could hear me speaking, drawing lines, and he can see the side-by-side -side comparison. And it, that th that takes me anywhere from three to four minutes to do. So it's, you know, those are like the little, you know, the small things that kind of tries to separate us from other golf schools. So we try to take a little extra mile just to, you know, to keep, you know, those people coming back to us. I think that's the important thing. You got to be, you got to be different. Now, Marcus, um, you talked about consistency a minute ago, and I and I have to um, even in my world when I talk to golfers, they all say the same thing: is I just want to be more consistent. I want to be more consistent. Um, and now that I'm doing more video, I take a camera with me, and, and these point and shoot cameras are so good now that they have video on them, and the video looks pretty good. It's HD video, so I put it up on my computer, and I'll go frame by frame. And the one thing that I notice more than anything is. Um, although people say it's, you know, you turn, you lifted your head, you lifted your head. It's more like you straightened your back. It looks like, you know, and their head does lift compared to when you're going side by side on a pro. And they even emphasize this on PGA events on television, how, how still their head stays. Um, where, yeah, where from your perspective, when they say consistency, what does that mean from an instructor's point of view? And what is it that you're able to, to, to provide for them? Well, I, I think consistency, a lot of it, when a lot of your students come to it with you is they hit so many shots right and left. 
you know, and I think kind of consistency comes down to really, you know, I, I talked a little bit a while ago about the body. I, I think the body really kind of keeps the club path and your club face, of course, with a good grip on path. You know, if you can consistently swing down the same swing plane lines, uh, down the same angle, and the club face is always square, I think that's where a lot of that consistency comes from. Because I think what a lot of us have is, you know, a little bit of grip issues, a little bit of uh, incorrect grip, uh, and your club face is off. So if your club face is off, you might start swinging, you know, across, you know, a little bit over the top to kind of, you know, fix whatever you're doing with your club face. And then your body has to do different things to kind of accommodate with that. So it's almost like, it's like a snowball effect. You know, we might go with a bad club face at the top of our swing. And then from there, we start finding a way how to hit it straight. And that's where I think everybody starts being a little bit out of whack. So a lot of times, you know, a lot of lessons, um, I had one this morning, it started with a guy who just a completely closed face. And then he had to kind of do a little bit of a hold off chicken wing. He couldn't release the club. He'd come over the top and it's almost like it's a snowballed effect just from the way he kind of set his hands on the club. So a lot of that consistency comes from just sometimes as simple as your grip. So people overcompensate all the time. Oh, you have to, if you do one thing wrong and you're in, let's say your backswing or at the top of your swing from there, you have to correct, you know, you're in the state of just, trying to overcorrect it. And, you know, people will find a way. You go out and hit a hundred balls, you'll find a way with a bad club face at the top of your swing or in your back swing, you're going to find a way how to make the ball go straight. And that's usually going to be with about two or three other swing faults. Mm. Yuck. And then you're, and then you're kind of just stuck there in those swing faults and, you know, you'll hit a plateau where you'll never really get better. When uh, I was down there, um, you were about to uh, go out and do a playing lesson uh, with some, I don't know if these were old friends of yours or just students who had, had continued to come to visit with you and you became friends with these guys. Um, but um, I'm curious, do you offer to anybody the option of either taking a lesson on the range for an hour and then they go out and play golf or for you to go out and give a playing lesson? Yeah, we actually do. You know, I, I, I love the playing lessons just because, you know, we kind of talked about it. With, <laughs> like yeah, a, slap it your wrist. Yeah, there you go. No, we didn't. <laughs> you know, with, especially, especially with my friends is, you know, watching them, you know, they spend all their time hitting full swing where, like I said, you know, we always talked about, you know, when I go on the golf course with them, you know, you have to kind of teach them to play smarter, you know, and that usually boils down to the course management and a lot of short games. And everybody, if they've got 20 minutes to, before their, to their tea time, they will hit golf balls for 19 minutes and 59 seconds. And then they'll go to the first tee, you know, and then they'll just overlook the most important areas, which is short, you know, how good are you from 100 yards and in? Can you be consistent? You know, and at the very end, I mean, that's really what, where your scores are going to dictate. So a lot of times I like doing it with lessons is I, I know everybody's going to have something they want to work on full swing. So if they wanted to do a playing lesson, I love for just to kind of not work on your swing while we're on the golf course. I'd rather, I'd love to, you know, maybe spend 30 minutes of just, we kind of work a little bit on swing, you know, just in a controlled atmosphere and then go to the golf course. So that way we can kind of work a little bit on course management, playing smarter, you know, where to play. If greens are tucked away, play a little smarter, play away from some flags. And a lot of people really learn just to, to get better simply by going on the golf course with a PGA professional. I think we need to institute a drinking game in uh, 2011 on the Golf Smarter podcast that anytime someone says play smarter or golf smarter, we'd, everyone, everyone has to take a shot. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for promoting the show. Uh, you kept saying play smarter, but we know you meant golf smarter. <laughs> and I'm starting to get loopy already. Um, <laughs> it, 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 so in, in – um, in in that 15 minutes on the driving range, the people you see uh, come out there and they'll hit balls for 15 minutes. Go, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's go out there. Um, well, did the first thing they probably do is pull out a driver and just see how far and hard they can hit the ball before they even stretch. <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, that's the first thing they're going to do is take some full swings. Where really, I mean, even if you had 15 minutes, you know, like 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 I said, you know, at the very end, I mean, how many putts are you going to have? You know, so many times where I'll go out with friends and, or I'll hear a friend come back from around and he says, 
Well, I, I putted terribly on the front. On the back nine, I started putting a lot better. And, I mean, how long would it have taken to warm up, you know, those 20 putts that he took on the front nine that probably cost him four shots? He could have hit 20 putts in less than five minutes on the putting green and already have had a little bit of touch going out. So, mm-hmm. like I said, sometimes five minutes of putting really goes a long way. Absolutely. Um, so give me your 15-minute warm-up, uh, you know, because especially you're on vacation and yeah, things are just kind of in manana time, especially in Mexico, and, and they, you know, get away, time gets away from you. So say you, you arrive at the golf course a half hour early, gives you enough time to put on your shoes, uh, get your clubs out of the bag, uh, go in and check into the clubhouse, uh, purchase your new hat. You end up with fifteen, ten to fifteen minutes on the driving range before your tee time. Uh, break down that fifteen minutes. How would you advise us to to spend it? I, I would take, you know, if I had a, a little bit of time like that, I would take my three most important clubs. I would take uh, the club I use around, let's say, sixty to seventy yards a minute. So when I first get out there, I'm going to hit little. I'm going to actually, I'll kind of do like a little staircase. I'll hit a five yard shot. And then I had a 10 yard shot, 15, 20, 25, and now b- grow it up to like 60. So I'll probably spend a couple minutes doing some sand wedges. Then I'll just hit a couple of little mid irons. Maybe some on part threes, I'm going to normally hit a seven, six iron from the back tees, maybe five iron. So I'll take one of those and I'll hit about, let's say five, eight shots. And then I'm going to hit the go-to club on the first hole, which is normally going to be a driver. So I just want to get a little feeling with the driver. So if I've spent about seven, eight minutes, nine minutes there, go to the putting green, and like I said, I actually I actually don't like to go to the putting green and knock in the short ones. I you know I think a great game to do when you first go to the putting green if you've got five minutes is take two balls and you know you always find you know maybe nine holes on the putting green. Play worst ball, you know go from one hole to another. Put two balls, pick the worst one, and then knock them it twice from there. So you know we're always got the superstar in us where it's going to leave a, a gimme, and then. We're going to have the guy that always shows up to the golf course who's going to blow it five feet, six feet by. So then take that second ball, hit two balls, and try to make par. So it's kind of you're just working on your consistency of speed and then, of course, you know, your routine of knocking in mm-hmm. little short putts. And I think with five to seven minutes of putting, I mean, you're good to go. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about playing golf in Mexico, um, which – the course that the Jim McLean School is uh, located, where where I played, is uh, Maya Coba, and uh, the course El Camelion. Um, notice I've been practicing it since the last time I talked to you. I can say, yeah, your Spanish is your Spanish has been much better. I've noticed. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but Maya Coba, uh, it's the only PGA stop in Mexico, correct? Yep, it's the only PGA stop. Uh, this will be its fifth year this year. I believe the tournament's February 24th to the 27th, and it's going to be its fifth year running. So, And it's the only spot outside the United States other than Canada and Puerto Rico. Mm, that's awesome. Um, and it's really a fun course. It was magnificent condition. And I was there, again, I was there in, in uh, mid to late December. Um and the, the course was just beautiful. It's it's designed by um, Greg Norman, and um, in, in if Greg Norman has a reputation in his course design of not moving a lot of dirt around. He'll he'll take the land as it is and build the golf course, you know, basically as it presents itself. And I think absolutely, yeah. And a lot of the courses that you know. Him being, of course, from Australia, a lot of his courses are the kind of courses that he grew up upon in in Australia, which are, have a little bit of a lynx look to it. You know, this course, as you saw, was very lynxish, where not a lot of rough. Uh, you can actually do a lot of chip and runs, and of course, it was cut through the mangrove trees, so you had a little bit of a, a lot of natural wildlife with a lynx type feel. So, uh, most of his golf courses that I've ever played, there's another one here in Cancun area called Playa Mujeres which is very similar. They're all kind of just links type look, you know, through beautiful mangrove terrain. Mm. There's one feature um, on the opening hole that I can only describe as unique. Um, it's the most outrageous. Uh, uh, let's see. It's, it's the most outrageous hazard I've ever witnessed uh, uh, in your 
in your wheelhouse. I mean, you drive right at it. Um, and why don't you describe it? Okay, so yeah, first hole is a par five. And like you said, it's actually called a cenote. It's a very dried up cave. It actually looks like a, a, a real cave a bear would walk out of. And that is your aiming point off the first tee. It's about, from the back tees, it's probably 330 yards. And from I'd say from the whites, it's somewhere close to the 280-yard range. So you drive straight at that cave. And what's pretty impressive is that once your drive will probably end up anywhere from 20 to 30 yards short of it, now you're actually hitting over it where the fairway kind of elevates a little bit. So it's actually very uh, intimidating because you're actually staring into this big, cave and you're trying to hit over it and you're just thinking the last thing you want to do is top it into it and then hopefully a bat's not going to come out and try and get you and go after your ball <laughs> and, and that's one of the things you got iguanas coming out of there you got a whole type of wildlife and you know there's some bats in there too so but it's very unique i have never seen anything like that anywhere in the world i've ever played golf no. Um, and I did shoot some video that day. I, I had a chance. They just matched me up with somebody else, and I was uh, playing with a uh, a gentleman from Argentina, and he was awesome. And so he's in the video, too, and I'll put together uh, a, a tee tour video of of the course. And as we were about to tee off, uh, the, the young man who uh, escorted us to the first tee box was telling us the story about when they were building the course that um, there was this big pile of leaves um, that this tractor went to lift and get out of the way on that first fairway, and the tractor fell in the pile of leaves, not knowing that there was a cave under there. And when they, they dug it out, it was like, oh, my God, look what we have. And really, there's this cave that you can walk down into, and, you know, if you're you're game enough, because there are bats that are going to fly out of there, but you lose your ball in there, and there's a couple extra strokes for you. But you got to play out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's you actually play backwards played as a hazard. It. Yeah. On on the PGA Tour, they play it as a lateral hazard. And, uh, yeah, you're right. like you said, the cave, I've a couple times have gone in there looking for other people's balls. I'll never say I've hit it in there. And you go in there, and you can actually walk in there probably 40 to 50 feet left and right once you get in all the way in there. It's, it's incredible. It really is. It's something else. Yeah. And again, the course is in phenomenal condition, and you do come right up to the Caribbean. There are a couple holes, uh, par threes and stuff. There's there's some a lot of water that goes around, you know, little lakes uh, or rivers. I'm sorry that that go around the course that you play next to. Um, there's some rock quarries, but you do come right up against the Caribbean too. Um, it's really really beautiful. And I just want to uh, say thank you to the folks at Yucatan Holidays Travel for uh, introducing me to you and and bringing me over to get the opportunity to play there. Um, and if you're planning a trip, if anyone's planning a trip down to the uh, the Caribbean side, the Yucatan Peninsula um, in Quintana Roo, which is the state there in Mexico, and you're going to Cancun or Playa del Carmen or Isla Mujeres, Cozumel, any of those places, definitely check out YucatanHolidays.travel and, and see what they can help you do because uh, you got to put very high in your list uh, this golf course. Just magnificent. Um, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to t talk to you about, as I talk about traveling to Mexico, people are very concerned about the safety of Mexico. Um, and I, I didn't feel that. Now you said you you have friends who still live in Houston, um, who are concerned for your safety being in Mexico. Yeah, absolutely. I get friends from Houston always sending me different articles because I really never watch the news and they always send you stuff, you know, this is going on, this is, this and that. And a lot of the stuff that goes on is border towns. And a lot of those are like Juarez, which is everybody's learned, you know, from news. And I always tell them, I mean, you guys are much closer to all that dangerous, you know, cartel stuff that's going on than we're here in Cancun and Playa area. Uh, Los Cabos also. I mean, Mexico does a really good job because they know tourism for them is a huge market. And like you saw down here, you know, you will see enough security around and it, they do a good job in tourist areas to, to really keep people safe. And, and it's not really let, you know, their economy go down because tourism is their number one economy here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've been going to Mexico for years and also people should be aware that the water's fine. You can drink the water. 
They don't need Americans uh, or Europeans. That's the other thing about Playa del Carmen. It's a lot of Europeans, South Americans, and people from Mexico City. Uh, Cozumel, uh, I'm not Cozumel, Cancun is more like a Miami beach or, or Las Vegas. It's very built up. There's a lot of, you know, just rows and rows and rows of very tall uh, uh, hotels. And if that's not the kind of Mexico that you want to visit, then you could still safely go uh, other parts of the Caribbean side or any parts of Mexico um, that cater to tourism. And it's very safe and the water's fine and the people are wonderful and the food is great. So, you know, just you have to just be smart about it. But um, and t I took buses. I took public transportation <laughs> everywhere I went. I just love being there with the rest of the people. I love Mexico. I really do. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, like, like I said, it just uh, the news in the United States is really just trying to make everybody be afraid of it. And really, it's, you know, at, at times it's going to draw a lot of people from not coming here. But like you said, you saw yourself. I mean, you were here. You took public transportation. I mean, it. That's probably the last thing most people would do, and you did it. You're safe. Don't even speak Spanish fluently, and you got around without a problem, yeah. without any problems, right? Yeah, it was real easy. And it's and their buses run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I never waited longer than two and a half minutes for a bus. There was always one coming in, and you say, you just name the hotel, and they're like, yeah, get on, get on. Don't worry, don't worry we'll get you there. And, you can, exactly. and I love the fact that like, I was walking down the street. Oh, here comes a bus. I wasn't at a bus stop. I just threw up my hand as if I was looking for a taxi in New York City, and the bus stopped. Yeah, come on, get on. <laughs> <laughs> After I left you that day, um, I was driving back to, to go pick up my wife, um, and um, I was passed by a truck full of – uh, servicemen, Mexican army guys, and they all had automatic weapons sitting on their laps. It was like, wow. And I, for some reason, I was like, okay, I feel safe. I'm not concerned about this. Um, yeah, there's enough guys around here. I think I'm going to be pretty good. Yeah, you really are. Awesome. Marcus, it was great to speak to you. I really appreciate you giving me the mulligan. I think that uh, I think I shot par today. I thought this was a lot of fun. I, 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 I think we, we might have shot a little bit better than par. We didn't do too bad. We didn't uh, do too bad. Well, thank you. And uh, a little long, but you know what? You had a lot to say and it was all of value. And you did say play smarter, golf smarter than there. I appreciate that. You win the week drinking game. <laughs> this week's drinking <laughs> game. <laughs> And then the next time we'll have to play it here again. So you have to come back down. You got it. Hopefully we'll bring a lot of people with us. That sounds good. All Thanks right. for having me.